Uh, welcome along to this first late, slightly late, uh, for 2011. Uh, nice to see you all again, those of you who've been before. By the way, I'm Finlay MacDonald, um, or at least a very good impersonator of him. Um, as we speak tonight, uh, one of the stranger military encounters in my recent memory <clears throat> and of recent years is occurring in Libya. The Western NATO alliance is using air power to support an uprising of uncertain origin, unclear means, and unknown outcomes by a rebel militia trying to topple Muammar Gaddafi and his regime. And yet, Barack Obama and other Western leaders insist their main aim is humanitarian, to prevent a massacre of rebels and civilians, and not to affect what is colloquially known as regime change. At the same time, it's almost certain that the United, United States, States gave the go-ahead for Bahrain to call in troops from Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Kuwait to actually suppress pro-democracy demonstrations. Clearly, one person's glorious uprising is another's dangerous insurgency. All of this began, recall, when democracy rallies in Tunisia inspired similar popular shows of will in Egypt, and what seemed like impervious dictatorships fell within weeks, regime change without a single cruise missile being fired. And yet the truth remains disputed. Was the Egyptian overthrow of Mubarak really a revolution? Or is it a military coup by stealth or something in between? Why are freedom fighters in Yemen and Bahrain not supported, indeed actively opposed by elements in the West? And does anyone really know what will happen in Libya? or what the laws of unintended consequences will bring there to the whole region and indeed to the world. To discuss this, I'm joined by people who know more about it than me. Uh, <clears throat> to my far left, Dr. Nigel Parsons, senior lecturer at Le uh, Massey University and an expert in Middle Eastern politics, and Ahmed Tarek Bagat Abaza, I did okay. Yeah. Um, Egyptian by birth, now living in Christchurch, um, where he's okay. Um, he's been studying and writing there and pursuing his other passion, music, and you'll be able to experience that other passion after this panel discussion. Would you please welcome my guests? <clears throat> um, Nigel, you've studied the region, you've lived in Cairo, I take it you were surprised, or as surprised as anyone? I think everybody was, 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 was surprised by the actual uh, unfolding of events. And, I mean, if we go back to really where they started as well, in, in Tunisia. Tunisia, which I've heard described to me by, uh, by Egyptians who've been working in, in Tunisia, as, kind of like as the, the sort of the East Germany of, the, of North Africa. The fact that the revolution could start in the most efficient uh, sort of intelligent service state in North Africa was a surprise to everybody. Was it a surprise to them as well? Well, it, I, and, and I think, you know, as you know, political scientists, uh, you know, uh, and me and my ilk, we don't have to feel too bad about that because this surprised <laughs> Tunisian intelligence. If the Tunisian intelligence services were surprised by it, you know, I mean, fair enough, we, we were too. Once... Once the trigger had been pulled in Tunisia, it was reasonable to suppose that that might have a knock-on effect in other places where you had similar social and economic background conditions that predispose um, a society to some kind of uh, serious, deep political unrest. But you certainly couldn't be certain that, that was going to happen. But there were, there were conditions there that, that meant that this was certainly possible. Good old-fashioned class revolution at some level then. There's, that is definitely a dimension to it, I think. I, I don't uh, see it as a Twitter revolution or as a Facebook revolution at all. In fact, it is when Twitter and the internet and uh, mobile phones were cut off that people left the screens and left their desktops to go out in the street. Uh, you know what I mean? <clears throat> so, uh, it's logistics. Twitter is logistics. Just to, another way to tell people where to go. It was also a way of 
the West and America trying to claim, take some responsibility or, yeah. or lay some claim to this <laughs> glorious um, uprising this because great, of their wonderful uh, technology. This great invention of Twitter, yes. uh, which you've given us, which is greater than writing and the ship and the sail and glass uh, and, our, and stone architecture. This great invention is what caused the revolution. It is not the people. This is the story, right? Yeah, yeah. that's the story, yeah, yeah. which a lot of people have bought, I'm afraid. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's worth stressing how Egypt is central to the Arab political and cultural world. I mean, that's why America didn't know how to react and was hedging its bets as long as it could. It really is fundamentally and pivotal, isn't it? It is, yeah. And um, let, let me just add that I kind of I picked a bit of this up. When, when I was at AUC and, and very close, it obviously has a lot to do with American the American embassy there. To be fair to the United States, and it's very rare that you'll find me adopting their <coughs> position, um, but to be fair to them, I think there, there was some frustration in American policy-making circles at the reluctance of the Egyptian regime to liberalize. Um, I think the Americans are you saying this goes back years, that there would have been think, internal battles within Washington? I think it does. And, of course, America is... Uh, Egypt was a banker for the United States for the reasons that we'll talk to. It's the centre of gravity. It's been described as that culturally, politically, um, and so on. It's the most populous Arab state. Well, I think America had been discreetly, over some time, prompting... He, the, the Mubarak regime to liberalise somewhat. You saw all sorts of change, for example, in the, I mean, certainly not adequate, but, but change in various dimensions of the ruling National Democratic Party. You saw change in the constitution to allow multi-candidate presidential elections. The result was a foregone conclusion, and they arrested the main contender afterwards, Ayman Noor. But nevertheless, that this, was a, this, was a, this was as a result of American pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in, in part, anyway. So, just... Um, I'd like to ask you, wh why? why? Why did they uh, push for these, what I think are superficial changes? I, well, I, 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 think there was a, I think there was a reading um, on the part of the United States that Egypt was, was, was potentially prone to instability yes. for some of the reasons so that we've already discussed. So they wanted to avoid... Discussed. And what, they want to what, avoid what, that. What, what actually happened. Yes. Because when you look at the Middle Eastern countries, demographics, economics, uh, endemic torture, endemic corruption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these are the kind of uh, ingredients for uh, uprisings and, and discontent. And uh, we knew it would happen sometime. Well, we thought it might happen sometime. But we never thought it would happen in our lifetime. But those reasons, those, you know, the chaos, the corruption and so on, or the, or the perceived um, reality of that, were also the reasons that I suspect aspects of the Western establishment thought that the Arab world wasn't ready for democracy. They needed strong leaders. Did you, you know, do, you, do you pick that? Well, this is absolutely Mubarak's view. I mean, he said it. Yes. I mean, it, yes. he, he, he did quite plain. Omar Suleiman said it too. Yeah. Omar Suleiman said it uh, too. They are not ready for democracy because if you get democracy, you're going to get the worst elected because we are just idiots who are going to elect the worst, uh, the fundamentalists. And the, no, no, no. Egyptians love soap operas, like I mentioned. So they don't, they're not going to allow uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to cancel music. To, uh, the Christians will not tolerate, uh, now, especially now when everybody's voices are louder. Uh, and, they're, and they're less afraid. Uh, Christians will not tolerate uh, uh, the laws, the restrictive laws that are still in existence. Mm. But the maintenance of churches, uh, but uh, the building of churches, it needs uh, approval from the president of the republic. Why? Why does it need approval from the president of the republic to fix the Pope Shinoda? Uh, he, he complains uh, when we need to fix the bathroom, we need approval from the presidency. That's ridiculous. So it's not, I hope that people will no longer tolerate this. Well, you mentioned fundamentalism. You can't get through this conversation without mentioning this. 
I mean, it has become the, uh, depending on your point of view, you know, the smokescreen or the real scary aspect of it, that if you allow a revolution to take hold, it will be hijacked by uh, jihadis and, of course, you know, war on terror part two, three, and four. Now, maybe that's in some people's interests to say that, but I'm interested in your views, you know. Nigel? Should you start? I, I, I uh -huh. can do, as you like. I, just um, a small topic. Uh -huh. Yeah, just a, another minor one. I, yes, uh, uh, two dimensions, I suppose, come to my mind by way of an answer. As one, I, which was a, a point that's been made in, in, in other places, one, we have no idea how popular the Muslim Brotherhood actually is because it's never been put to the test in an election, not a free and fair one. Um, we, we have no, so we have no idea what their real level of support is. Um, but there are indications that it is considerably less than is, uh, than is surmised in, in, in some quarters. Um, two, I think there's the, the question of the Brotherhood themselves. How radical are they actually, you know, given, um, you know, given and, and given the circumstances that they're in now, um, they seem to have comported themselves quite wisely up, up, up to this point and uh, certainly said some of the right things. And then I suppose if we want to add a third one in, just it kind of brings the two together, I suppose. I'll completely agree with, with, with Ahmed from what I know of Egyptian society. It's just, it doesn't strike me that, that big chunks of it anyway are, just, are at all well disposed towards real religious radicalism. Yeah. I just don't see it. Mm -hmm. Our old friend Christopher Hitchens has written, um, and this is a quote, if Saddam Hussein was still in power, this year's Arab uprisings could never have happened. Okay, discuss. <laughs> no, he also claims that the influence of post-Saddam Iraq on the Libyan situation in particular um, can't be underestimated um, because obviously it's a, you know, A, a dangerous strong man has been removed and B, we have the example of the possibility of democracy flowering. I'm not sure about the example of possibility of democracy flowering. Nothing has been flowering in Iraq so far. I mean, um, mm. it, but it is an interesting proposal. If, uh, but how can we answer this? If Iraq didn't happen, if the war didn't happen, what would have happened? This is impossible. I can't predict the future, and I can't predict uh, uh, alternative scenarios. Uh, well, the Americans could do a victory lap of the Middle East and North Africa. Why not? They see can, how they yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, they mm -hmm. can do a tour. Um, we're actually cruising towards the end of the session, but um, it would be good if we had some questions from the floor before we wind it up. Oh, is it not uh, the events happening is similar to what has been the inevitable destruction of previous civilizations that has happened in Sumer, Incas, Easter Island, uh, you mentioned the price of bread. Uh, there's insufficient uh, food becoming available for a massive population. And uh, that's, I think, to me, this is the main reason for the uprising. Pure and simple economics. No. Hunger. Need for bread. The need for bread. Well, uh, I think that's what Ahmed said it, earlier. It's yes. not just economics, it's also the endemic torture. Uh, we used to joke, me and my family, when we watch Mubarak on TV uh, when we were young, because he appears everywhere. He's on the uh, wall, in the streets, uh, everywhere. There's big, big, big signs. So the only thing left is for him to come out of the tap, the water tap, okay? <laughs> so we were uh, waiting for him to come from the water tap, where then we'd be drinking Mubarak. <laughs> and, and, <coughs> yeah, it, it's, it is definitely, definitely inflation and the fact that people cannot afford uh, basic things is a, is a major reason because we can see palaces being built and then some people cannot eat. But it's not the only thing. There's the endemic torture, 
There is uh, the fact that it's a police state and under emergency law without an earthquake, uh, you know? Yeah. I guess the question is, and this is where we'll have to wrap this up, yeah. and it's a big question, and of course you can't predict the future, but both of you. Are you optimistic about what has been started and where it will end? Absolutely. You have a history going back you know, at least 100 years or so, on off of, of, of constitutional government. Um, you have a, a history, you know, prior to the coup, of um, semi-democracy. I think you have a, a, a pluralistic uh, society. I think you've got a context, global context, that is going to encourage that. I think for all of those reasons, it'll take time, it won't be easy, but for all of those reasons, I think Egypt has, for my money, an odds-on chance of, um, of an altogether more open, honest, and, and dignified future. Ahmed? Well, I'm also optimistic, but with the reservations. I'm optimistic because something has been changed radically. People are actually willing to go and protest en masse, which is not what used to happen before. And now they think that they can speak and that someone might listen. And this is big, and it has spread. Once the Egyptian president resigned, all of North Africa and the Arab nations uh, increased their uprisings. There's something now that has changed in the public discourse. The public discourse has changed radically, and it's, uh, they're talking about revolutions and getting rid of old regimes, uh, the ancient regime. Uh, uh, hopefully, there will, it will not go like the French Revolution, but uh, the Egyptian Revolution is the one about the cleaning of the square, not about the guillotines. And I'm very happy and proud of that. And on that note, we'll actually end it. And in the meantime, would you please join me in thanking our guest, Dr. Nigel Parsons <laughs> and Agat Abaza. And thank you very much for coming.